Hi, everyone. I'm Andre Sr. at KTVU Fox 2 in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're looking into uh, COVID-19 and the possible treatments for it. We continue to do that. We're joined now by Dr. Stephen Soloway to talk a little bit about that drug, that much talked about drug, hydroxychloroquine, uh, that we've heard so much about from uh, President Trump. So here to talk to us more about it is Dr. Uh, Soloway. Doctor, first of all, uh, we've had some uh, late uh, updates and that the Food and Drug Administration Friday warned against using hydroxychloroquine um, to treat COVID-19. Give us your thoughts on that. Um, so hydroxychloroquine, which uh, the chloroquine family of drugs are originally anti-malarial drugs. In the past decades, because of chloroquine resistance, um, those drugs are no longer used to treat malaria by and large. Um, we in the United States, in the field of rheumatology, uh, give hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil, we give this to all of our lupus patients, 100% of them, because it is proven with scientific data to uh, reduce lupus flares, reduce thrombosis or blood clots in lupus patients, and lower cholesterol in lupus patients. And um, interestingly enough, for decades, the mechanism of action of how it did this in lupus was not known. It was only discovered in the last 10 or so years to how it even worked in lupus. Now, chloroquine, which we would often use as a substitute if a person cannot tolerate because of, say, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, if a person couldn't tolerate hydroxychloroquine and they had a lupus rash, we would try to switch them to chloroquine. Well, in my practice in the last seven years, I have not been able to obtain chloroquine for anybody, so it's not available in this country, at least not as of uh, three months ago, to my knowledge. And, and, and now, so what, why is that exactly, that it's not available in this country? It may not be available in any country, frankly, I don't know, but hydroxychloroquine, which is available to every one of my 500 lupus patients and my rheumatoid arthritis patients who have nodules, which are the two indications that I use it for, all of those patients have had never had a problem getting the drug. But now, half of the patients are telling me they can't fill their prescription because their pharmacist or somebody else has told them um, you should give up your drug so that we can give it to uh, coronavirus patients because it's going to save their life. Does that seem right to you for, for, for no. pharmacists to be telling people this? No. Um, the patients that are already on it, those people have the right of passage. It's their drug. It's the way of their life. And before those people became stable with their lupus or their rheumatoid arthritis, um, these people were on the path perhaps to disability or or even death, you know, uh, once you get side effects or problems from lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, the minute you hit the hospital, now you hit a whole new domain, a whole new domain that you don't want to be part of. You want to try to avoid the hospital. You want to avoid whatever bacteria is floating around there and, and so on. Oh, I apologize. My, the phone is ringing. Sorry. So um, you want to avoid uh, going to the hospital if you can. Um, um, so I feel that stopping a routine drug for a patient with a, a serious disease is just a, a bad thing to do. Now, if, if the drug were made and manufactured in the United States, we could probably ramp up production. But the drug's not made in the United States. We rely on 10 different countries to get this drug to the United States. Israel donated, I, I believe, 5 million doses from Teva, T-E-V-A. Um, it's a pharmaceutical company that makes generics. They were one of the larger donators of, of drugs. Um, it's my understanding that the United States government has 18 million doses of the drug on hand. It's my understanding that um, the one trial that was done in France on 30 individuals um, who have had coronavirus received the drug. And of the 30 people, um, and I want to clarify certain points as I tell you this. So 30 people with coronavirus in France actually received hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil. And one of the patients died, three or four of them went on ventilators, and the other ones did well. Well, so first of all, there's no control arm, so it's not a valid study because we have no comparison. Um, however, I will say that if one person died out of 30, 
that's 3.3%. And the touted death rate for the coronavirus is only one to 1.5 or maybe 2%. So one out of 30 is, if they studied 60 people and only one died, then you'd have the expected death rate, but they only studied 30 people. So um, I, I, now I wanna go back and clarify a couple of things. In the population of lupus patients, the patients receive 200 milligrams of the drug twice a day. Prior to lupus treatment, when the drug was used to treat malaria, it was, treating, it was used on weight-based dosing, five milligram per kilogram, which at that time, people were receiving 600 milligrams a day, not 400 milligrams a day. It's my understanding that the coronavirus patients who received the drug received a six-day course starting with 600 milligrams and stayed on the 600 milligrams for several days and then went to the 400 milligram dosing towards the end. Now, in my practice and in the practice of several colleagues of mine in rheumatology that have tremendous lupus populations, we consider the drug to be universally very, very, very safe. So because it's so safe, I applaud President Trump for saying, why not try it? What have you got to lose? Now, I've heard other people say, gee, you know, the death rate's higher, you need to check the heart and so on. Well, in practicality, at the 400 milligram dosing, we don't do that. And we don't have any people dying from plaquenil toxicity or getting severe side effects. But I did want to ask you, the FDA did say they've received reports uh, of uh, adverse effects in people uh, from poison control centers dealing with serious heart-related adverse events and death in patients with COVID-19. Um, so is this, is this even safe to treat people if we're, if we're seeing this uh, and the FDA is issuing this warning? So I don't know if I can trust that information. I've used the drug personally more than anybody at the FDA has used the drug. And after 30 years of treating lupus patients and having 500 patients taking this drug on a regular basis, year in and year out, only having have needed to do the screening ophthalmology exams to check the retina, because if you have retinal deposition of the drug, you have to stop the drug to prevent blindness. The case reports of um, cardiomyopathy or muscle weakness from hydroxychloroquine toxicity are few and far between. So they are known to exist, but they are known to exist so infrequently that it'll be discussed at a national meeting if it occurs three times in two years in the whole country. And this is out of, um, I want to say, um, two million people, perhaps, I think, have lupus in the United States. So, but with this push from, we heard the president push this, could this be a problem with hydroxychloroquine and the effects of COVID-19? Or could it be some underlying issue if you have COVID-19 that's maybe adversely affected? when you take hydroxychloroquine? So I would say that the patients who have COVID-19 who are already sick in the ICU, who come in with pneumonia or respiratory distress, uh, who, are, who are, we already know that they can get cardiac toxicity or, or cardiac muscle toxicity, myocarditis, muscle disease of the heart. We know that that happens with COVID-19. Now, we know that that is reported with hydroxychloroquine. However, of the millions of people in the US that take the drug on a regular basis for lupus or some rheumatoid arthritis, we just don't see these side effects. So I find it very, very hard to believe that the drug, which is probably safe enough to be in the water, and we joke about that as rheumatologists, that the drug is safe enough to be in the water, how it's killing people. So I think it's the COVID uh, that is killing the people and the COVID that is causing the heart damage but we don't do any cardiac monitoring in the field of rheumatology for patients who take this drug. And why somebody would implicate this drug, um, maybe they have an ulterior motive. Maybe they just don't want this drug to be used because they don't like the president or something. I mean, that's a little bit of a conspiracy theory on my part, but I think the one thing I can say about this drug from 30 years of using it on enormous numbers of people is that I don't see any side effects from it. In fact, when the only, the major side effect of the drug 
that used to occur when people took 600 milligrams a day for malaria was skin rash. There's a rash called erythema multiforme, and it's a skin rash. It doesn't kill people, but it's a rash, and it's a very annoying rash, and it has to be treated like a condition. But that would be the side effect I would look for in COVID patients getting this higher dose of um, hydroxychloroquine. I'm so used to calling it plaquenil, so excuse me if I say plaquenil. That's fine. I, you, I, think that you've, I think that you've done a, a good job of, of, of calling it both names so people who are watching this can understand um, why, why you're saying it. But uh, the, 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 the other name you're using is the actual pharmaceutical name, not the brand name is what you're saying, correct? Yes, 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 yes. So, so I, I gotta ask you, so what do you want people to know as they're introduced, everyone's watching the news, they've heard it from the White House, the use of hydroxychloroquine to treat COVID-19. What do you want people, the public, to know about using this drug in connection with COVID-19? Okay, I want people to know, in my opinion, this drug does not cure um, COVID-19. This drug does not treat or mitigate the symptoms of COVID-19. And this drug is extremely safe to take no matter what disease you have, unless you're allergic to the drug. And, and re remind me again, I just wanna, just remind me again, who are the people that you're prescribing hydroxychloroquine to? All, 100% of my lupus patients, unless they had an allergy to the drug, which is very, very rare, at least in, again, in my patient population, so all lupus patients in the United States are supposed to be on hydroxychloroquine. And I use it selectively in rheumatoid arthritis, but in particular, I use it in rheumatoid nodulosis because bad rheumatoid arthritis patients, you know how they have like an egg on their elbow? So that would be a rheumatoid nodule. And the rheumatoid nodule, which is seen in, it's seen as a poor prognostic indicator and it's seen in severe cases of rheumatoid arthritis. The mechanism of action of how and why people get nodules is different than the rheumatoid arthritis itself because the drugs that make the rheumatoid arthritis better sometimes make the nodules larger. But Plaquenil happens to shrink the nodules. So it's a good drug to use in rheumatoid patients with nodules. So I don't use it because we don't need it really in rheumatoid arthritis. We have better drugs. I, I, I want to ask you, we've heard about hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. What's the difference? Um, they're derivatives of each other. So practically speaking, there's not too much of a difference. So now we're seeing this change here, this, this information from the FDA warning not to use it. Um, are you feeling that we're heading in the right direction in terms of this? Because I have seen other doctors who say, yeah, we're treating our patients with COVID with this. Um, I, I've seen this and I'm like, well, maybe they know what they're talking about. But, but well, you seem very certain that that's not the case. Uh, okay, so I'll, let me make my case. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm an old man, pretty much. And since I was a child, I got vaccinated against measles, mumps, rubella. And now people get vaccinated against hepatitis B. Uh, people get vaccinated against uh, shingles. There's vaccines for um, any virus you can name. And the point I'm trying to make, there's no cure. Viruses aren't curable, okay? The only virus known to man that has a cure happens to be hepatitis C. And hepatitis C is a whole other topic, but there are special characteristics about that virus where the antiviral drugs cure it, completely eliminated from the body. And after 30 years of using HIV drugs, what they call antiretroviral drugs, finally, they're starting to get some people to have no detectable viral load in their blood. However, if we look at viruses as a whole, we've never had a penicillin which came along and it just stopped bacteria in its tracks. So throughout history, measles, mumps, rubella, rabies, parvo B19, uh, chikungunya virus, Zika virus, um, Cox, uh, Coxsackie virus, um, uh, herpes, shingles, uh, human papilloma, which causes cervical cancer from genital warts from the virus. None of these things have treatments. They all have vaccines. So to think that an anti-malarial drug is going to cure 
a virus is really trying to shove, not push or put, it's trying to shove a, um, a real big square peg into a real small round hole. It can't work. What, what, I've, what I've seen, read, and understand is that because of actions um, of uh, Plaquenil, I do believe that it probably will prove to reduce viral shedding as long as it's administered to the right patient population at the right time. And that's what needs to be studied because if the timing can be worked out from an exposure to when you're shedding the most, perhaps you can prevent people around you from uh, being as susceptible as they would have been prior. But to think somebody is gonna have the virus and take the pill, it is impossible, absolutely impossible. Anybody who thinks that it saved their life, their life was saved by God. They got lucky. All right. Dr. Stevens Holloway, uh, thank you for finding your insight into this. 30 years of, pre of prescribing this medication to people with lupus uh, mostly, and uh, you're sharing your insight into what you think you could do. I really appreciate you sharing uh, a few minutes with us and giving us your insight into this drug that we've heard so much about. It was great talking to you. Thank you very much. All right.